Welcome, my name is Jennifer Roeder. I'm a communications consultant for AppFed and I'm moderating today's webinar. Today we'll learn about accommodations in school from Sharon Rose Gargula, a school nurse and a co-author of the National Association of School Nurses position statement on 504 plans. Sharon has been a school nurse for more than 25 years, working closely with other support staff. She advocates for students with healthcare needs, ensuring that Supports needed to be successful alongside their peers are put in place. More than 22% of the 750 plus students she supports yearly have either an IEP or a 504 accommodations in place. Welcome, Sharon. All right, thank you, that was so nice. All right, let me share my screen. Well, thank you for such a wonderful um, introduction. I just would like to start with an overview. My, the, the goal of my um, this presentation is really to help those of you who are providing for school age children with information on how to advocate for accommodations that will help your child be safe and successful in the school setting. This is more of a generalized because I know that some of you have children that are just starting school in the elementary, like uh, preschool age, all the way up to high school. A lot of my focus is middle school, so just bear with me with that. Um, I just wanna begin with my journey. My journey with 504s began when I was a new mom and I realized that my child was floundering in school. I relied on the help of my aunt, who fortunately for me was a teacher and a special ed coordinator. I am so very grateful for her help to have paid, and I have paid it forward with students and families that I work with, including my own granddaughter. Being an advocate for them is part of being a school nurse. My first experience with EOS is um, when I had a parent, I was working summer camp and I had a new mom come in and she had a cooler full of supplies, a very detailed written instruction and a list of who to call in what order and for what. To this very day, um, the, the child, Jess, who is now a grad student in veterinary school, and I laugh about it. So starting off, an IEP is also known as an individualized educational plan. We just shorten it to IEP. This is a plan or program developed to ensure that a child who has disabilities that are identified under the law and is attending elementary or secondary education receives specialized instructions. So an IEP is created based on developmental and cognitive needs of the student. It changes how the student is taught and what and how their academic goals are measured. A child who qualifies for an IEP most often are performing at a lower academic level than their peers. Because they are working below grade level, the curriculum being used is modified, and that's the key. There is a modification to the curriculum. This is a simple um, definition, and in the resource um, page, I did um, include the link that if you wanna read the 400 pages, go right ahead. A 504, other um, section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, also known as a 504 plan, um, again is developed to ensure that a child with a disability identified receives accommodations that will ensure their academic success. So where an IEP has a modified curriculum, the 504 uses grade specific curriculum. What this means is that the accommodations are put in place that will help the student be just as successful as their peers in a general education classroom with the general educational curriculum. Now, just to note, a disability is anything that impacts a child's um, ability to be successful in a classroom. So it could be ADD, ADHD, OCD, anxiety, panic attacks, broken bones, vision, hearing impairments, autism, I could go on forever. But just because a 
somebody has a disability, that does not mean that they have a developmental delay or are not as intelligent and as capable to be successful as their peers. It means that they have limitations that make learning or navigating the educational environment challenging. This is where the 504 plan comes in to play. It helps level the playing field. So the major differences for between a 504 and an IEP are where the um, 504 just needs a medical diagnosis. The IEP, you, the child will be tested for the developmental and intellectual gaps. The 504 uses grade level instruction. IEPs have specialized instruction. They also have a modified curriculum. They, um, the other major importance for IEPs is that special services, OP, um, PT, speech, um, they all are part of an IEP. Another big thing is that a 504 can continue into the work, into college and into the workforce. So as you can see, the differences are major. Students with IEPs are placed um, in classified categories and, and the classrooms and goals are based on these classifications. They are retested every three years and their files are audited. The 504 follows students as well, but there is no government oversight. The students are not classified. There is no formal formal procedure for beginning or terminating a 504, whereas an IEP needs an um, eligibility determination meeting as well as an exit meeting. Now, the commonalities are that they both have expected timelines for completion, starting at the time of a request. I believe it's 10 days but please don't hold me to that. They are both reviewed yearly and that is a minimum. Both are very fluid documents, they're living. They can be revisited and revised throughout the entire time that you are using one. Um, I like to, the other thing is they are both created by uh, multiple team members, including parents and students. I truly believe that a student, as soon as they are able to, should be part of both teams if, if you're choosing an IEP, but the, this gives them the ability and the experience to start advocating for themselves. And that, because sometimes we're just not always there. Um, students also have a very difficult um, insight on what works for them or what doesn't work for them, what they find really helpful what is a nuisance. And when they start college, it will be up to the student to go to the dean and make sure that their 504 is in, in place. We as parents cannot do that for them. So having them start earlier in the process is to their advantage. All right, so now we're going to start the process. Meet with the school nurse or the 504 coordinator. Some schools here in Delaware, where I work, there is a school nurse in every school all day long. So a lot of times I am the one that um, picks up on the fact that the child needs a 504. But there is a 504 coordinator. Reach out to both of them. A written diagnosis is um, required and will be placed in the student's cumulative folder and health records. These are for things like um, ADHD, OCD, but it, it is not necessarily necessary. And the doctor does not have to write an order for an IEP or a 504. You as the parent, or caregiver have that right. When you um, start school, provide a wish list for the things that you would like to see in place. But please note 
that this is a wish list. There are some things that we cannot accommodate. So if your wish list includes, I don't know, Chef Ramsey coming in and making awesome meals for your child, the schools just can't do that. Um, sorry about that. Also, um, set up a time to meet with the 504 team so that the plan can be created. Um, now, remember, once you request a 504, the clock starts ticking and you should have a meeting within 10, day, 10 business days. Now, most forms can be sent and reviewed and signed online. So this should not be as problematic as it was in the past. We, um, that used to be a major um, barrier, but now with the computers, it is much easier to do. Now, here's part of the team. You as the parents or guardians, and, um, and underneath that, I have a parent advocate. If you feel you need a parent advocate, then you have every right to bring somebody along to help advocate for you. The school nurse or health aides, the school counselor, 504 coordinator, teachers, and that includes professionals, related arts or specialists, um, like the special teachers for your art, your gym, your music, your child's primary health care team. Though I have never had any primary health team be a part of it, they've we've invited them, they just haven't come. Administrative team, your the principal, the assistant principals, the student support team, and that would include the social workers, psychologists, speech therapists, OT, PT, and there are other important members of the team. Um, that you may find such as bus drivers, the cafeteria staff, the district uh, nutritionists. Not, now, not everybody needs to be invited. And truth be told, if everybody showed up, if all these people showed up, it would be a very long meeting. And I would have to look really look for a room. Though so I've... Um, have requested, like I said, and gotten um, permission to share information with the medical team. They have not um, participated in the meeting. The, though having a release of information form ready so that if there's questions that the um, 504 team could speak with your child's um, medical health team. Uh, now, in my building, often it's either myself and the school counselor or 504 coordinator who notify one another that there is a need for a 504. And together we sit down and we draw up a very basic um, plan, one where things that are, are, we are anticipating as accommodations that are needed. This is a time saver that and it also allows you as the caregiver parent to know that we are taking this seriously and that we have really kind of did a little homework and these are the things that historically are needed. Now, some possible accommodations, and these this is not an um, an exhaustive list. This is just things that I came up with off the top of my head. Um, things that the health room or the nurse's office would have, the things at the classroom, and then the others things that are not necessarily in a specific place, such as. That all absences are excused with um, that are with a note from a parent or a practitioner or what happens on field trips. I have privacy up here for bathroom usage or for if your child is receiving two feedings, maybe changing their clothes for gym if they don't want to have any questions if your child is, uh, has to have a, a change of clothes for gym. 
I look at what's works best for the child. If um, if drinking every two hours is what your child needs, then having a designated refrigerator in the classroom may be an appropriate accommodation versus them leaving class, coming down to the nurse, having um, their supplement, and then going back. That may be a lot of seat time that they're missing, and you may not want that. It might be just as easy to go get their drink, come back, drink, and then continue on. Having um, a container in the classroom, and I am using this as a classroom, mostly elementary. So once high school and middle school start, the children most often are changing classrooms throughout the day. So that would have to go into the nurse's office or like a designated area. But having a container of safe snacks kept like a, in the classroom where um, if there is a reward for the class and one of the rewards is um, a, a food um, a food item, then your child has a safe item that they can eat. My girlfriend, um, the child that I mentioned earlier, she would make um, a Rice Krispie snack that was safe and appropriate for her daughter. Come to find out that the entire class liked these Rice Krispie snacks. So she ended up providing a big container full of these Rice Krispie snacks as uh, food treats for um, the entire class, which made her daughter feel very inclusive. Um, also, maybe instead of having a food item as a reward, non-food items, um, and, and that would be in an accommodation that they had uh, computer time or a eraser or something that they could pick that is not related to food. The whole um, goal of accommodations is to make sure that your child has as normal school experience as possible and so that they don't feel isolated, that they don't feel very, very different. Um, I also put um, on here, allow the child to, to choose to participate when it comes to a certain activity. So when in middle school and high school, we have a pacer test where they have to go through climbing a rope, doing sit-ups, doing push-ups, and maybe they have, they still have a two feeding in place, not having two feedings during the day, but still in place. And maybe these activities really are very uncomfortable for the child. And so allowing the child to have that voice also helps them be very successful and enjoy the school day. Now here I have a sample. This is only a sample. Each child is unique and individualized, but these are things that I would have basically on here so that as you as a parent would know that we are working this out. This may some work, may some may not work for you, but the, if the, um, you see the accommodations on the one side, and so the first one, students will be marked absent, excused when the note is provided. And the person responsible, it's a parent, the PCP, the main office. When the child is older, I would have the child on here too, to hand in that note. Um, again, uh, having extra time to make up assignments due to absences. The general rule is that if a child is out for one day, they have two days to make up the assignment. If they're out three days, they have four days to make up an assignment, you know, and again, this is dependent and would be um, something that the teacher, the student, and you as the parent when they're younger, have a conversation to what will work best for your child. Um, the beauty of this a 504 again, is that it works. You may find that you may not need this. You may need, like you may have on their student will, if they're going on a field trip, student will be accompanied by parent 
and or nurse. And you might find that this is not what is needed, that your child, when they're older, middle school and high school, they may not want you as the parent or especially not me as the nurse because I don't do those kind of funky rides. Um, on here, the student would be provided with appropriate snacks when the classroom is having a celebration or more importantly, that the, you will, as the parent caregiver, will be notified when outside foods will be provided as part of a learning activity, such as a hundred day, this is the hundred day of hundredth day of school, count out a hundred M&Ms. Um, your child may not be able to have M&Ms, but if you know ahead of time, there may be something that your child can have that they can have count out a hundred individual things. Um, if, uh, you know, on here, it may be that your child is allowed a, um, a sippy cup and your sippy cups don't are, they're, they're colored for the most part. In general, we allow clear water bottles. So having something, a, a bottle that is not necessarily clear with a straw would be also an accommodation that could be on here. What is really important though, is to advocate for your child. I want, um, I would really appreciate as a school nurse, getting a heads up if, if, again, I'm in middle school. So as a new sixth grader coming in, an email, hey, um, I'm, I'm Zoe's mom and I just wanna have a conversation with you. Though I don't work during the summer for the most part, I would absolutely, and any school nurse would absolutely come and meet with you and your child at a, a time that works both for you. So again, meeting with the teachers prior to the new year, um, offering to come and speak to your child regarding the uniqueness of your child's disease and what works best for your child. You can do this during um, like the two weeks before school starts. You can again, set up an email and have it so that you meet all of us at the same time. The other thing is when you're, if you're ready and you're able to speak at a PTA or PTO, which is the Parent Teacher Association, Parent Teacher Organization, so that other parents also um, are aware of why they need to let the teachers know what they're bringing into school if it's a food item and what the ingredients are. Now, this also goes meeting with the teachers and the students, not only during transition years, but if you're also coming into a new building or if there is a, if you find that there is a new, um, the nurse has retired and there's a new nurse coming in. Bring along your child so that they also can meet these new um, adults that they're gonna be interacting with. Familiarity also helps with compliance. If a child knows me, expects to see me laugh, it knows what my office looks like and that it's not intimidating. Um, this is where their um, drinks are kept. This is where their foods are kept. This is their bin if they need other things. This is where their um, stuff is. It helps reduce their anxiety and stress which again helps with compliance. Yeah. Um, I'm just reading along here, making sure I'm... The other thing is to start an open dialogue with those adults that um, are gonna be working with your child. If it goes back and forth, if, if that, you know, they, they feel okay asking a question, you'll be more apt to get more cooperation and less stress. That way they also will be more apt to give you a call 
if they find something in the classroom, this happened in the classroom, this was said in the classroom. So I have to tell you, going back to my young friend, when she was in preschool, she was graduated to a sippy cup and she was very, very excited. And the teacher noticed that when um, Jess brought out the sippy cup, there were other comments being said in the classroom. So she met, she set up a meeting to meet with the, um, the teeth that herself, her, um, Jess's parents and, um, you know, an admin just to, to have a, a plan so that Jess felt included and did not feel as though she was being bullied. So the day of the meeting comes and the teacher sits down and she was kind of sheepish. She says, I have to apologize. I did set up this meeting. Um, I wanted to avert any um, possibility of um, a sensation of being bullied or you know, not feeling included. But as she says, as I sat there in the um, classroom, she heard Jess um, speaking to this one vocal child who was saying, oh, you're a baby, you're drinking out of a sippy cup. Um, only babies do that. And before the teacher could jump in and intervene, Jess turned around and she said, yes, I am drinking out of a sippy cup because I have a disability. Because of my disability, I have to drink out of a sippy cup. And if you have any other further comments or questions, we can go out in the back and have a further conversation. And you know what? That just shut down that whole conversation. So advocating for your child is great, but allowing your child to advocate for themselves is just as powerful. It reinforces that they're okay and that they have a voice. And again, why I like to have them part of this process, I want them to be able to be advocates for themselves. And I have to tell you, this child was, was just a little bit of a thing. Now, I have an individual health care plan up here, and I know that's not part of an IEP, though, and it's not part of the topic um, that I was originally asked to discuss. However, when I was looking and listening to other um, presentations in the series, this struck me as something that is very important and another avenue for you as parents and caregivers to make sure that your child is safe and exists and successful in schools. So um, though an IHP, and that's what I'll call it an IHP, it's not part of the, the, an academic plan. This is an, um, this individual health care plan is unique to your child. It provides at a glance what your child needs, what the child should be working towards as far as, again, self-efficacy and what the expected time frame that they should understand what they need. This is also very, very helpful for um, health offices that do not have a full-time nurse all day, every day in the building, that somebody else, an, administration, an administrator may be working in there, an aide, a, a parent. So again, these are this is just a sample. This is also more age appropriate towards a middle schooler. Again, that's where I work, but it can be adapted and for any other elementary school or high school. And these are things that, you know, there's a knowledge deficit if they choose not to take their meds. I understand that when they become teenagers, there's a a bit of rebelliousness, and that is with all teachers, I mean, all teenagers. So having the, ch the child verbalize signs and symptoms that are associated with not taking their medications is very helpful. Also, um, I did notice that uh, food impaction, and they may have signs and symptoms of being impacted, and that what to do for that. Um, do, you know, having, and again, on this, you would have it more specified, but, you know, smaller pieces of meat or 
food or whatever it is that they're eating. There are more bite size um, sizes. Is there an alteration in comfort relating to pain? Like what kind of pain is this? Is this belly pain or, you know, especially for our females, is it, again, middle school and high school, is this related to menstrual? Like helping them differentiate the pain so that we are not um, calling you for everything, but also that we can also provide comfort and we're just not missing something thinking, oh, this is just um, your menstrual cycle when it is something more serious. And then again, potential for alteration in skin integrity is the area around the feeding tube, red, hot. You know this as an adult and you've been caring for your child, but again, um, promoting self-efficacy, they need to know also what does it look like. Now, there is another piece to this called the emergency care plan. Again, one goes with the other. And this um, is there, do they have trouble swallowing? Is it due to a food impaction? Um, or as it's down on the um, lower, is it, have they been exposed to an allergen that they really need serious attention? So if it's for a food impaction, again, I, uh, notice that uh, warm water or Coke or carbonated beverages, whatever works for your child, um, you're going to give this. And again, this is very um, simple. It is very small. For your child, it could be much longer and much more detailed. But I also have numbers. Call mom. This is mom's cell phone number, home phone number, work phone number, dad. Um, is there a stepmom? Is there a grandparent? Whoever you would want would be on this um, form. If for the younger child, what if the food, uh, teeth feeding tube fell out? How to re like note the time it fell out? Insert a new tube per instructions. Call mom, or if you want, if it's if this happens and you would want um, their GI doc notified right away then that's what you would have on there. And again, you would have that um, note in the chart that there is communication between the um, healthcare team and whoever is in the building caring for your child. Um, so in summary, the very best way to make sure your child is safe and successful is through ongoing communication. I cannot stress that enough. I just, as a nurse, I appreciate it when I get emails. Um, Zoe had a really bad night. Zoe had a tough weekend. Um, we're starting a new food. This might happen. Um, they've been really having a lot of gas pains. Venting the tube is important. Just that ongoing communication. And together with that communication, we are a team. And it, I, I truly believe that it is a village that helps children be successful in school. It is a village that can make sure that children are happy and are safe. Here are my resources. Again, if you, um, and, and truly, if you just do um, IEPs, whole big um, list come up, 504s, whole big list come up. And thank you. And I am absolutely waiting for questions. I do really better with questions. Well, we appreciate all the wonderful information and look forward to the discussion part now. So the first question that came in is about 504 plans. So sure. if your child has a 504 plan and is frequently ill missing school, when would it make sense to switch to an IEP? In this case, the child has no intellectual disability. So you could, here's the thing with um, an IEP, they, your child would be tested. So there is a battery of cognitive tests. So even though 
um, your child is missing a lot of school, they may not qualify for an IEP because they are not intellectually um, below their peers. However, you can, if your child is missing a lot of school, there are several things you can do. One, you can get homebound instruction. Homebound instruction is where a teacher would come to your home and tutor for X amount of hours per week. That does not mean that your child cannot come, come to school. Your child most certainly can come to school. So if your child is averaging three days a week in school, then the homebound instruction could come could come in for those days and it is added support for tutoring, if that makes sense. Um, there are some for um, us in, in Delaware, we have um, First State School, which is a school that is the classroom is inside our one of our local hospitals. And if the child is placed in there, then there is a um, an IEP, but that is a total medical IEP. But so I know this is as clear as mud. So if a child is missing that much of school due to um, their disability, we as a school would work on, we would create, you can create it by an IEP if the child is going to a like first state school where it, the, the classroom is inside the hospital and there is medical staff along with teachers, but in that classroom as well. Does that make sense? Did that help? Whoever asked that question, did that help? If you have a follow-up question or if you have a question that we haven't asked yet, please feel free to click on the Q&A box uh, within the Zoom window and type in your question. We, we definitely have a, a nice chunk of time here to be able to answer questions. So, I mean, an IEP can be made, but for the most part, we would see if accommodation, different accommodations can be um, put in place. So it can be flipped, it can. I don't wanna discourage that, it can. Next question is about um, EUE specifically. So our school nurse wrote a write-up of EUE that is extremely inaccurate. Like they mentioned that it increases the risk of anaphylaxis, which is not true. Um, what advice do you have to be able to correct medical information that's provided by the expert that's inaccurate? Oh. That is so tough because as you saw on mine, I did not say there was an increase in anaphylaxis. I just said there is a potential. And I think just having conversation, I, I am sorry that they wrote up something that is so daunting and inaccurate. I, I am sorry. Um, Knowledge is powerful. And again, just going in and sitting with maybe the nurse and providing other, um, providing your website, the um, afid.org website would be an awesome way to start. If you have, um, if you have found articles that are in medical journals, absolutely. Actually, if your um, child's healthcare team may have come and have, um, do an in-service for the school. I know that's asking a lot of your healthcare team, but depending on what state you're in, um, I know that we have a lot of um, in services and presenting to all of the school nurses may be an awesome opportunity to 
defunct some of the myths. Or depending if it's close by, you know, just tell them that I'll come and talk. I'll, I'll be fine with that too. We, we appreciate your eagerness to help everyone. Thank you. Actually, me and Jess will come and talk. My, my, my good friend, she and I can come talk. There you go. Wonderful. So people are rearing up for the start of another school year, as hard as it is to believe as we're in the middle of the summer. Um, how often should plans be reviewed? Like, does a new plan need to be created each year? Or is it a matter of just reviewing a plan for, that would continue? So a plan is just, review, once the plan is created, then it is reviewed. And it can, it's, should be reviewed yearly at a minimum. Often, um, so for example, my children who have diabetes, we review those plans once a year with the parent. It, it, and it's also that the, the year is when the plan was created, not when the school starts. So if you have a plan that was just created in May of 2023, the, the yearly review will be May of 2024. If there have been changes, most, most definitely go and review, have that plan updated. But it's not, they are not, they are not a school year. They are a calendar year for review. You've talked about a number of different types of plans by the floor, IEP, different things. Is a written formal plan always needed for one of those things or do accommodations sometimes happen outside of that? And do you have a preference for how parents approach it? It's such a great question. I believe um, I do not, oh, I do not have a whole lot of um, individual health care plans and emergency care plans because I am in my building all day, every day. If not, I have a sub. Now, I do have plans in my sub folder for children that I want. There's just very specific things. But for my children, I believe that accommodations some accommodations are just common sense and they do not need to be written down. So uh, keeping your child's um, formula or supplements in my refrigerator is common sense for me. Having the child come to me or if that child wants to go into the classroom, that's fine. So. Again, that would be something that would be between you and your school building nurse or whoever is working in that health office. It is not hard, fast, necessary. If it gives you a peace of mind, then it is necessary. If that makes sense. Like I, um, one of my favorite accommodations are preferential seating. There are 25 kids in a classroom and if 18 have preferential seating, what does that look like? So you just need to put the child where the child will work best in the classroom. Is that, again, clear as mud, I'm sure. Like there's just a lot of different options and it seems like the most important thing is to start with a conversation and find out based on the school setting that you're in, what is gonna work best for your individual situation. Absolutely, get to know the people who are working with your child. So if you come into my building and you're sitting with me, um, some parents want a very strict, all right, I do this, 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 this kind of nurse. You're not going to get that in my office. I'm going to listen. I'm going to say, well, this how this is how this works in my office. So how can we combine the two? Um, I also, again, if it's an older child, 
sixth grade and up, even I would do fourth grade and up. And if you, depending on where that child is developmentally, um, third graders, we had that, uh, like I shared the story with just as a preschooler, if they can advocate, let them say what they would like. Would they like um, to come down to the nurse? Everybody likes to come down to the nurse. But if, as you as a parent is seeing that my child is missing 20 minutes of every class because they are visiting the nurse, then maybe the nurse is going to go and to your child in the classroom. That's another, like, you know, I, and I do that. I go to children in the classroom if um, they're spending more time with me than I don't give grades out. It doesn't help them. So having that conversation and working as a team, you as parents bring so much to the table. And sometimes you just have to re, just kind of re-emphasize the things that you want. So for the um, parent um, who shared that this nurse had all this information, the nurse may have been misinformed because she was, oh my gosh, I have this child and you need, these are all the terrible things that can go wrong. So they're taking a uber cautious um, approach versus being kind of, yeah, whatever. I don't know if that helps that parent. But definitely there's so many different approaches. And so I appreciate that you're encouraging people to have conversations with their nurses. Um, absolutely. One, Come talk to me. Absolutely. So one thing that you've mentioned a few times is how you're able to be in the building all day long. Unfortunately, not every school has that set up. So for those parents who have children in schools that have nurses that are in the school on a part-time basis, what tips can you provide for how to work with a shared nursing situation? Again, all right, so first and foremost, go into the school and, ha and, have, an under and, and, and have an understanding of what the layout looks like and what the, who the healthcare um, person in that building is going to be. Secondly, um, it could be, and here is where I would promote having an IEP, but it could be, especially as your, if your child um, in pre-K to about maybe third grade, you could potentially have an IEP and have a fact that the child um, needs a para with with them at, at all times, or at least a, it, or at least in a room that has a para, which is a paraprofessional. So that if the child needs to go walk down to the nurse's office, or if um, you need to really monitor that they have, they did drink their two ounces um, and they are doing it at the specified times that it are needed then that is very helpful. That would be that would be something I would absolutely pursue. Sometimes depending on how um, acute your child is, your health insurance may provide a nurse to be with your child. So we have some children who um, are in continuous two feeds during the day and they have a outside agency nurse assigned to their child who comes into the building with like on the bus in the building back home on the bus that may also be um an option but again if you're if knowing that you have, um, you may not have a, a, a nurse, you may have a mom who really is on the ball 
And if they're working in the health office, then having a conversation, this is what I need. This is what I need to do. Um, you as a parent, and I never want to put the burden on the parent. Um, that is not my intention at all. But you as a parent also has the right to go into the school if you know you need to do a tube feeding and you're not trusting, and that's a terrible word, not meant. You just don't feel this. Your child is safe. I guess. Never mind. I'm really bumbling this one. Sorry, I'm bumbling. But having that, um, you as a parent or caregiver have that right also to go into the schools. Yeah. So perhaps if the extra assistance is needed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so I am not putting the onus on you on the parent. I think that the school needs to do whatever they need to do. Great. So some children and parents are getting ready to go to school for their very first time this fall. And so there's a lot of new things that are, that are happening. What tips do you have for self-advocacy to teach a child as they're preparing to go to school? So, you know, some things you can do is if, um, again, if the child's drinking out of a sippy cup, okay? And you know that for their safety, they have to drink out of a sippy cup. See what happens if you hand your child a cup that is not a sippy cup. If they look at you and say, and, and just drink it, you're going, oh, no, you know, there's a teaching moment here. But then if something happens and somebody hands them a regular cup, they know that they have to have a sippy cup. So, and that's just very young. Having um, having that conversation, again, it has to be where that child is. Um, so, and I can use my granddaughter as an example. When she started school, she was, di she was diagnosed as a diabetic. So, we had to really help her be an advocate to say, you can talk to somebody if they ask you why you're giving your, or sticking your finger or giving yourself a shot. Or you can say, I just don't want to talk about it right now. Those are the kinds of, sometimes just those little things are giving them the power to choose whether they want to share or they don't. Um, as going in at um, having them meet the teachers so if there, there's, it's my assumption that there's always an open house before school starts. That's my assumption. And going in and meeting, knowing that you're going to, um, this is where your classroom is. This is your teacher. Let's walk down to the school nurse. Uh, during the summer, I will go in to my building if I know that I'm having a, a child come in that will be seeing me. And I go and I introduce them and I show them my office. Um, this is where, like, I, again, this is where your stuff is. When you come in, this is what I'll say. Um, for you, this is where your drinks will, your, your, you know, your stuff's going to be here in this basket in the refrigerator. Um, we're going to rinse out your cup. We're going to put it over here. Or I might even put it in the refrigerator because it's all together. But allowing your child to have a voice and you know what if somebody if they it's a transition and now they've been with the same group for three preschool and now they're going into first grade and it's a whole different school um what would you say you know tell ask ask your child if somebody says this what would you say and giving them just giving them some vocabulary, giving them some ideas of what they can say and of being allowed to say, I really just don't want to talk about this. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yes, I will unmute myself and it will make it much easier to hear me. <laughs> sorry. Oh, no, no apology needed. Trying to make that sure you don't hear my dog's bark. not my repertoire <laughs> lip reading yet. So one of the people that you showed as part of the team for caring for a child in school sometimes can be a parent advocate. 
Could yes. you talk a little about, about what is a parent advocate and when you might need one? And if so, where you can find them? So a parent advocate is a um, is someone who is sitting back and listening to most parent advocates um, that I have, in fact, all the parent advocates that I have encountered have been associated with the IEP, okay? And what their role is, is to sit back, listen to what the teachers are saying because they're not emotionally attached. So they sometimes, um, anytime you're making a 504 or an IEP, there is some emotional part on, on, on the part of the parent because it is emotional for us. We want the absolute best for our child. So an advocate sits back and listens and says, oh, well, this, uh, this is what I'm hearing and this is not going to work or why the parent wants this and they will make sure that that particular um, accommodation or goal is discussed. Whereas the parent, if, if the teachers, if, if the teacher says, no, we cannot pick your child up at the doorstep. Um, we can't put that in the IEP. It would be the um, advocate's role to say, why not? Why not? This is what we need. And it could be very much that the bus cannot navigate the cul-de-sac. Um, you would find parent advocates. That's a good question. I've never looked up a parent advocate. My thinking would be to start at the district level in student services. Um, that is where you could you could give that a try. You could look at your local um, Google parent advocates for my child in my area. Um, so they would, that's what I would do. Um, and you asked me one other question about an advocate. When should they consider using an advocate? Oh. So you've talked about who they are, what they do. Yeah. So at what point should they consider getting help from a parent advocate? So we find that when the parent advocates are called in is when you have um, requested meetings, requested meetings, met with met with the team over and over again, and still. Um, for example, an advocate would be you have met with the team, met with the team, met with the team, and still your child is being um, is choking because they've given been given a piece of food that should not. I mean, this is an example. This is a, a bizarre case, but it was something like that where you know what the plan is not being followed, even though you have had multiple. Um, dialogue, multiple meetings, in-person meetings, Zoom meetings, emails going back and forth, and the plan is still not being followed, that is when you would want an advocate. Would it be accurate to say that a parent advocate can be helpful to resolve conflicts? Oh, yes. That would be, um, that is really what is hopeful, that it is a resolved. A lot of times, if um, the other thing is, is if you are still not getting results with, um, through the, the, um, the, the communication and the meetings and going up higher into the, to the district level and asking for a district level meeting. So you would have, um, the director of social uh, student services who oversee the whole thing. You would have the um, assistant director of or for 504 coordinators. So all the 
bosses would be in. And you would also you would also want to do that sooner. I mean, you can absolutely have an advocate, but my suggestion is to do it sooner. And then again, you, you can do that and have an advocate at the same time. Another challenge that students with chronic illnesses and disorders, such as eosinophilic disorders, can have is having a large number of absences um, mm -hmm. due to doctor's appointments or just challenges with their conditions. Does a 504 plan play any role into whether an absence is considered excusable? Um, it can. I mean, as I said, you can have it so that if, if the note comes, truth be told, any note coming from a parent or a healthcare provider, the absence should be excused. Now, the thing with excused absences, the child's still on their um, record. It still will say an absent. It doesn't mean that it obliterates the absent. It just means that this absent is known and had a good cause. Um, that's in, and then in when in the accommodations I did put, you know, parent PCP office. That's or whoever does the attendance. In in my building, it is the main office. But I also put the child down because if the child doesn't turn in that note, the onus again is on them. And but any note provided by a doctor or a child or a parent should be excused. If it's not excused, then definitely have it in the 504. So when students miss a, a fair amount of school, uh, you touched on the amount of time that they might be given to be able to make up the work. Mm -hmm. Making up work can be different from getting to sit in on the instruction and getting that information. Um, yeah. Are there any resources to help tutor students to on what they may have missed in the classroom? Uh, yes. So again, um, check with your school. In my building, we have tutoring available after school. So if a child misses a day or they need extra help, we don't even do it. We just say a child, any child who wants extra help can stay after school. If the absences are impacting their seat time, that's when we would do homebound and a teacher would go out to the child's home um, or you could, or the child could go, they could meet at the library if the parent doesn't want it. Like it, it doesn't necessarily have to be at home. If that's creeping people out, it could be at the, a library or, but the child then we'll get one-on-one uh, -on -one instruction on their grade, on their subject content with that teacher. And I believe it's 20 hours a week. So if the child is able to, and that doesn't mean that the child has to be home. We just say homebound instruction because it's the instruction is happening in the home, but it's also that child can come to school. So if child's having a great week, child comes to school all week, they still can have that, those hours um, to help keep them up. Also, if the child, if, if you find that for whatever reason, spending, like if the child's in school all day, one day, then they miss a day of school, like then they're too um, whooped to be in school the next day. You can do with a 504, you don't need an IEP. With a 504, you can also do a modified school schedule where they come in half a day in the morning, maybe half a day in the afternoon the next day, half a day in the morning, like, and you can modify their school day along with the um, homebound instruction. 
Well, thank you so much for all of the resources that you shared today and all the knowledge. Um, you know, we've gotten some really nice thank you messages come in here talking about um, the flexibility that you've referenced it, that's important for people to be able to have because there's so many different situations. So I hope everyone will um, take away uh, the importance of having a conversation with your school nurse and having the conversation with the people at your school that's taking care of your children. I know that's definitely on my to-do list before the school year starts for my kids. Um, so thank you, Sharon, again, for your presentation and for all of your insightful answers today. Well, thank you again. Have a great new school year. Go talk to that school nurse. And if you don't have a school nurse in your building all day, every day, legislators are really your best friend. Have conversations, have some lots of conversations. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you also to our education partners for their support of this webinar series, including Bristol Myers Swift, GSK, Sanofi, and Regenera. If you enjoyed today's webinar, we hope you will also check out another great opportunity for virtual learning, which is our annual patient education conference. We recently held that in Denver, Colorado, and you can now watch the virtual content on demand. Um, so if you missed us live, go check out the recordings. You can go to atfed.org slash conference and be able to register as a virtual attendee. Another great opportunity to continue learning is by signing up to subscribe and listen to our podcast, Real Talk Eosinophilic Diseases. In the latest episode, our co-hosts, Mary Jo Strobel and Holly Notowitz, talked with Dr. James Franciosi about proton pump inhibitors and EOE. It was a really interesting conversation. So we hope you'll, you'll take a listen to that. You can find the episode at atfed.org slash podcast, as well as on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, and more. Finally, we encourage you to continue the discussion started today in our online community on the Inspire Network. It's a great place to connect with patients and caregivers for support. We hope you'll check it out at appfed.org slash connections. So thank you again for joining us for AppFed's EOS support webinar series. If you have a question that didn't get answered today, please send us an email at mail at appfed.org. We hope everyone has a great afternoon.